Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the India Today Mumbai Conclave. Three years ago, this city and indeed large parts of the country on television were almost riveted to one story. And one woman was at the center of it all. Some saw her as a vamp, many saw her as a vamp, some saw her as a victim. She was caught in a story which seemed to take unimaginable leaps. She was accused of being of a, abetting suicide, at times of murder, and eventually charged with financing and harboring drug trafficking. She has finally not only got bail, but the Narcotics Control Bureau did not challenge her bail in the Supreme Court. She's now doing MTV roadies, hopefully a few films, but she was three years ago at the center of the Sushant Singh Rajput case. She's gone to hell and back. Please welcome Rhea Chakravarti. Well, Rajdeep, <laughs> meeting you again under different circumstances, huh? <laughs> meeting me in very different circumstances. Uh, I want to tell this audience, I met Rhea Chakrabarti for the first time and uh, was subject to heavy trolling as a result when I did that interview. People even thought that India Today had chartered a flight to take me to Mumbai. The truth was, it was COVID times. I was wearing a PPE suit between, in the middle seat, a spice jet, late night flight, because I thought that we needed to hear Rhea Chakrabarti's story. And I'm going to play a little bit at the start from that interview. Before I ask my first question, just look at Rhea Chakrabarti, August 27th, 2020. Hello. I told that in his funeral, उनकी लिस्ट में मेरा नाम नहीं है इंडस्ट्री के काफी लोगों का नाम था और मुझे उनसे पता चला कि मैं बिल्कुल नहीं जा सकती हूं क्योंकि मेरा नाम नहीं है और वो लोग मुझे वहां नहीं चाहते कौन नहीं चाहते उनकी फैमिली मुझे दैट्स अ लॉन्ग टाइम अगो व्हाट्स चेंज्ड बिटवीन द रिया चक्रवर्ती देन and the Rhea Chakraborty I see in front of me today. Well, you invited me to the conclave today, didn't you? <laughs> I wasn't being invited to things then. I'm being invited to things now. That's a very big change. Um, but beyond that, Rajdi, firstly, thank you for interviewing me then and giving me a platform to, you know, have my story out there when everything was one-sided. I always believe that there's two sides to a story. And not everyone believed in that that day. And uh, today, again, life has come a full circle where I'm speaking to the media after 2020 for the first time uh, because I didn't think that I wanted to and I didn't think that I was ready. But uh, now that life is moving on and I want to move on, uh, I don't think there's any other place better than this for me than India Today and you, of course. Um, the new me uh, is very different. I've been through a lot. I feel like an 80-year-old woman inside a 31-year-old woman's body, uh, mentally at least. There's a lot of uh, positive learning and uh, there has been a lot of pain. Through that pain, I've had to go through a journey and that journey could ha only happen if, I dis if and when I decided to go through it. There's two ways when you go through something, Rajdeep. Either you go through it or you escape it and you avoid it, you don't think about it. You can become Devdas, you can choose those kind of things. Um, but I chose to actually go through it. I doused myself in therapy um, because I believe that the only way out of a trauma is actually addressing what happened. What happened to you? What was said about you? What that was said about you? What is that thing that affected you the most? Why did it affect you? Why does anyone else's opinion about you matter? And in the process, I think that the real difference in the person who I am today versus the person who I was in 2020 or before that is that my inner voice uh, is louder. It's much louder and I can hear it over and above any other voice, thousands of voice, uh, voices, a billion of voices, and it's the only voice to me that matters. You're saying that's the only voice that matters to you, what you think in a way of yourself or what your family thinks of you. 
who stood by you through all the bad times but you still polarize opinion you know there are people who when i put this out on twitter a little while ago that i'm interviewing ria chakraborty they said there it is it's going to be fixed and rajdeep is going to give ria chakraborty a platform there will be you know it'll be trending uh, boycott ria chakraborty or boycott rajdeep sardesai for doing this interview many still see you as in some way involved in the sushant singh rajput suicide case are you telling me none of that affects you even in this room there could be those who'll say but you know did she really have any role to play in sushant's suicide how do you respond i can you really shut it all out um honestly when i enter a room i can see it in people's faces i can see some people thinking mm, maybe she's done something i can see some people looking at me with pity hi bichari kaise zinda hai um and i can see some people feeling like oh you know we're rooting for her she should go forward in her life and i can kind of hear their thoughts even when i have these conversations with people i can hear what they are saying in their mind sometimes they're looking at me and thinking that doesn't seem like she doesn't seem like a criminal and and i can feel that thought but at the same time does it matter to me absolutely not and i rajdeep actually didn't have a choice in that matter because if it mattered to me then i wouldn't have been able to sit here even today i wouldn't have been able to walk from my house to my car and come here dress up and sit in front of an audience and talk to a journalist a good journalist but a journalist right i wouldn't have had to, i wouldn't have been able to do that i would have been taken under by anxiety ptsd which is post traumatic stress disorder for people who don't know and i would have constantly overthink what people are thinking about me are you telling me that all those words that were used against you at the time chudel hai black magic kiya hoga sushant par are you telling me none of that has had any impact on you hasn't scarred you in some way I kind of like the name Chudel. <laughs> I think it's interesting. I think back in the day who was a witch? A witch was a woman who did not subscribe to the patriarchal society or had her own way or had her own opinion that was against the popular opinion of men and patriarchal societies back then. Maybe I am that person. Maybe I am a Chudel. Maybe I know how to do black magic. Who knows? Because you're wearing this jacket smash the patriarchy and I want to play a visual or when you were first called by the ndp uh, by the ncb the narcotics control bureau and you wore a shirt saying violets are blue uh. roses are red let's smash patriarchy me and you you saw this as a patriarchal mindset that she must be the evil woman who in some way must have poisoned this wonderful young man is that how you saw it it is how it was it is how it is in our society unfortunately even today um if some man is successful and he gets married and then his his success ratio drops they are like dekho jab se ye iski zindagi mein aayi hai iska career kharab ho gaya hai if he starts drinking too much they like oh jab se iski shaadi hui hai bahut daru pee raha hai as if the man had no identity of his own before a woman men in india most definitely don't listen to their wives or girlfriends please they don't <laughs> and if they were then it would have been a much better society let me promise you that <laughs> so they don't so i listen to my wife i'm terrified of her so you're a good man you're a smart man <laughs> so i feel like it is a patriarchal society and which is why a lot of the things that were being said about me were in the in the sphere of patriarchy that isne aisa kiya jab se ye aayi wo badal gaya he had his own identity before me he was a he was a guy who came from a small town he made it so big in bollywood that is not a mind that can be controlled by and there is no black magic in this world actually i just wanted to clear that <laughs> no because in that interview there's something you told me which was revealing you said you want to know the truth about what happened with sushant because there were rumors flying around at the time that it wasn't suicide it could be murder and you wanted to know what happened to him 3 years on CBI hasn't moved a step forward in the inquiry or at least not in the public domain do you still want to know the truth and do you know the truth what really happened to Sushant Singh Rajput why did a young man seemingly destined for big things in Hindi cinema commit suicide 
you know what the truth is the truth is that uh, mental health is not understood in this country at all we are taking strides and i'm i'm happy that the youth is now talking about it and india is moving forward in understanding mental health but when someone who's famous has a mental health condition people don't understand they are like he has fame he has success why is he depressed i don't understand because the fact of the matter is people are working their entire lives struggling for what two things fame and money so when they have somebody who has fame and money but one second he is depressed to main ye kyu kar raha hu ya main ye kyu kar rahi hu that's what not doesn't sit well with people so mental health is completely misunderstood or is slowly getting understood i would like to say and because of which it's very difficult for people to consume or digest the fact that someone who's rich and successful and famous could be mentally affected could be depressed did you know that do you still know the truth about sushant do you did you know that he was mentally depressed at the time and do you still know the truth of what took him to take his life as many believe he did see i could i could never know the truth of what uh, took him to do what he did because i don't live in his mind contrary to popular belief uh, but i do know the truth about him being mentally ill i do know the truth about what he was going through and i'm hoping to hear the truth and i think the agencies are doing their job and in the right time in the right place they will give their verdict because the fact is you were accused of procuring and supplying drugs to him that was the charge under which you went to jail you spent 6 weeks in jail for that charge would you accept that you were according to those who see you as a villain exploiting his vulnerabilities in some way do you believe that you made certain mistakes at the time do you concede that you did supply drugs to him no <laughs> and secondly i am done with this topic i don't want to talk about drugs i don't want to talk about ncb the matter is sub judice i don't want to talk about cbi let the agencies do their job and let us do our job which is talk you talk to me about my emotional state and how the hell did i get out of that and sit on this chair today to have this conversation with you how about that but the charge sheet is still there let's be clear the charges are still there your passport is still impounded there are lookout circulars that still exist your brother still is also battling it he was also dragged into this so it can't be that easy to say let's not talk about it it is still there somewhere in your life the fact of that you spent 6 weeks in jail baikala jail uh, accused of harboring and financing drug trafficking see about harboring i'll have to ask pablo escobar but i believe he's no longer like amongst us uh but the other stuff i don't think that uh it affects anyone else's life but mine i do have lawyers and we are fighting it in the court of law and we will get our verdict in the right time and i will accept whatever verdict the court gives me in my case or in anybody else's case because i'm an indian citizen and why the hell should i not what was it like and i'll play those pictures of a young woman suddenly finding herself being hounded by cameras wherever she went uh then eventually being taken to baikala jail where you spent what 6 weeks almost 6 weeks what was it like for someone who came from a middle class family father in the army and army doctor suddenly finds herself in baikala jail so from aspiring to be a bollywood actor you're there in jail give us a sense of what that period was like well jail can't be easy um interesting it is it is very interesting because you are removed from society you are no longer part of society you are put into this place because you are no longer fit to be in society for whatever reason society deems you unfit um you are no longer a person you are given a ut number so there's a lot of disassociation with the ego the i the atman as we call it in hinduism that you feel and you experience you disassociate with the personality that you are born with or you create from 0 to 9 if you if we know in psychology and you start viewing yourself as nothing you are a number you have to do as told uh, you have to eat when told you have to stand when told um and that in itself is a very humbling experience 
for anyone who goes through it. And I hope to God that no one in this room ever has to go through it, or no one in this world actually ever has to go through it. But in, in my case, uh, there were goods and bads. There is an initial period in jail wherein you fall, you fall. It's like you're falling from the sky into an abyss of nothingness and there's just black around you and you don't know where you're falling. You don't know if you're going to come out. You start losing hope. You start losing touch with people outside. You don't. You stop believing that people are fighting for you outside. You question all kinds of bizarre things. Uh, you think about, uh, you know, not wanting to live the life that you're living. Uh, but then there is a time, a time came for me in jail wherein I learned a lot from seeing the women that I saw in prison. So I was in an under trial prison, Rajdi, which is not convicted. People in under prison are not convicted. So they are still innocent. Innocent until proven guilty. That should be the motto of the legal system in India. Innocent until proven guilty. Not guilty until proven innocent. And I believe that anyone is innocent until then, unless the court passes a verdict that you are guilty. And you have exhausted all your three courts and you've reached Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has said that as well about you. So that's not happened in this jail for all the women in there and for me. So I believe they're all innocent. And I learned from them that some of them have been there for many years, five years, six years. Most of them don't even have access to lawyers or they don't have a family support like I do who's fighting for them and trying to get them out. And they don't have media glare, which has its cons, but the pros is that your case will be seen, will be heard. There will be a time for your story to be told as well. In that situation, I saw women suffering far worse than me, being the happiest people I've ever seen. In the one or two moments of happiness that they got, it could be a festival where the jail was providing them samosas. The way they would eat that samosa, the way they would eat that samosa, they would, they would gobble that samosa with happiness and passion and desperation. And I've not seen a more stronger life force in any human being around me, not even enlightened gurus. And having seen that, I, I realized that you know, we chase, I will film this film, this film will hit, so I will buy this car, then I will be happy. It's rubbish. You are given a few moments of happiness in your life, snatch them. And that's what I learned from jail. I am here to snatch it. I am told, I am told that on the last day as you were leaving jail, some of your inmates, fellow inmates asked you to dance for them. And you did a dance for them? Is that true? Yeah, so the day I got bail, my brother didn't get bail. And I was devastated. It was the only day that I broke down entirely in jail. And I had promised all the girls that, you know, I'll nachungi. They were like, Ab liye nacho, nacho, nacho. I said, Jis din bail hogi, us din nachungi. A bail ho gai. But I was not happy. My heart was hurting. So I, I, I kind of refused them at first when the jailer came up to me and said, Rene do tum mat karo. And I said, ha, ha, ha. But as she walked away, I said, you know what? I am leaving. And I'm probably never going to see these women again. And if I can give them that five minutes of happiness by putting on a dance performance for them, then why the hell not? And so I did. And it was the most uh, ecstatic moment of my life because we were practically doing the Nagin dance on the floor. And <laughs> you all did a Nagin dance in Baikala jail. I would have liked to be there as a fly on the wall. <laughs> on the floor. And um, the excitement and joy and happiness that I saw in these women's eyes while I was dancing for them, with them, is uh, probably the highest point of my life till date. You know, <laughs> since then, you've done MTV roadies recently, but you haven't done a film, or you haven't, no one, you haven't, been, you haven't signed on a film, or no one's come to you and said, Ria, we want you for a film. How has the Hindi film industry looked at you? You walk into a room with all these big producers, directors, actors, do they also see you in some way possibly as the vamp out there? Do you believe that even Bollywood uh, also judges people much like the rest of society very easily and you've been judged all too easily? I think Bollywood is also people. Like they are also people. Some people are nice, some people are not nice, some people are judgmental, some people are empathetic. I have, however, experienced a kind side of them. Uh, as far as work is concerned, I have told them that you will be in the film, you will be in the film. I have said, Abhi Vakt Nahi, you will be in the film, you will be in the film, you will be in the film, and it won't work for the film. 
so that fire had to die down for someone to now probably come around and say let's do a film together and maybe my ambitions uh, and my understanding of the world has changed a bit now but having said that to satisfy the unrequited dream of the 17 year old me who came to bombay city to make it in bollywood i would want to make it in bollywood you don't want i would to. want to make you it you still in. want to just for so her. The, the dream that dream still lives on that you want to one day still make it in bollywood you think that's possible dreams are not meant to be broken or crushed i had a dream i'll still have that dream and i'll pursue it maybe for the rest of my life you know while you chase these dreams the question will come that how does one get closure when you've gone through what you have as i said you've gone to hell and back what will it take for riya chakravarti to believe this is a closed chapter in my life i simply look at a new world what will that take how do you get closure or have you already got it i don't think closure is the right word um i don't think you can get closure from something like this the thing is that i faced a personal loss there can never be closure on that front uh it's grief it's it it engulfs your life at start and then your life starts growing around it but it always exists it's always there in your back pocket it's always going to rear its head from the back and be like i'm here i'm still there don't think i've gone so i don't think i'll get closure in that sense but has my world perspective changed yes am i willing to be inspired by life and people and am i feeling motivated again to put on a nice dress and come and give an interview yes so i think that's as good as closure as it gets for me for now how much of this and i'm just going to get the camera slowly to move to your family how much of this the strength that i see from you today and even what i saw in august 2020 despite the fact that you broke down in between is because you were convinced that your family was convinced that you were innocent all of it i think my entire strength resilience came from my family my father being in the army i think you know we had that army upbringing and i remember when you know everything was at its peak uh he told me he said you know in the army when we are getting shot at we don't lie down and go we stand up and take the bullet on our shoulder we take it so take it and even then if you have to go you will go but at least you stood up and you gave yourself a last fighting chance so i would give it entirely to my family if it wasn't for my mom dad and my brother and even nidhi my friend is here some of my other friends shibani dandekar anisha a few of my girlfriends who stood by me we were a handful of people um and we were facing mobs the size of billions but i think that's all you need three four people who trust you and love you they are pillars of sanity and you're good you're golden you felt those television cameras that were entering your life were like a mob yeah they were a mob when they i felt like those cameras were guns were they not yeah those are the pictures you felt the camera was intruding right into your life it doesn't get any closer than that even in terms of physical space i want to in a mob for a moment turn to mr and mrs chakraborty uh mrs chakraborty you want to there's a mic that i'm going to give you uh there you don't want to say a word your mom doesn't want to speak but possibly your dad who i remember was there that evening when i met you for the first time are you all both have you all come to terms with what went to uh, your what happened to your daughter and your son good evening sir we'll never come to terms with whatever happened because no parent can come to terms with their kids being thrown in jail but uh, yes acceptance slow and steady does come up acceptance shobik you're a young man who was hoping to go and do an mba abroad you still also have charges against you have you come to terms with the fact that you were thrown into jail i just feel like it's like a part and parcel now it's just a part of my life which i have to get through and you know go ahead with and charges has actually charged me up even more so i think uh, life has you know i have a long time to go ahead when you see your mom and when you see your mom and dad there and your brother who also was charged with you 
I mean, have you tried to, what kind of family conversations have you had in the last couple of years? It can't be easy. They're putting up a brave front. Your mom doesn't want to speak. Yeah, yeah. It's only natural that they don't want to speak. I think I'm very proud of them for even being here uh, and supporting me and being in front of cameras and media, uh, given that media was the enemy and media was intruding into our lives and, and ripping us apart piece by piece and trying to destroy us for, for no understanding of ours. Like, we don't understand it till late. Uh, but I'm, I'm very proud of them. And I think the only reason we've gotten through this is because we've each stood by each other. Everyone had a bad day and everyone had a weak day. But as a family, we had this family glue that kind of told each other, today, this one is going down, so you have to... Let us all put on a brave front. Let us all be better for this person. So we stuck together. The unity we had, uh, we truly served under my father in that time. I believe we were like a small regiment and he was the colonel. So I would like to say, Colonel Chakravarti, it's been a pleasure serving under you. You know, uh, you've targeted the media. I mean, targeted in the sense... Targeted! Been, okay, you... In, targeted! In this, in this interview... You have guts, Rajdeep. No, no. Okay, let, let me rephrase You that. have guts. Okay. You were the target of a... Me you, you, you blamed the media for the role they played. The media vilified you. Now that you're back from hell in a way, do you still track the media as obsessively? I still see Sushant Singh Rajput trending. Justice for Sushant Singh Rajput still trends. Do you sort of observe Twitter every morning manically? What have they said possibly about Sushant or about me? Or have you given up on the media? I'm not on Twitter. You're not on Twitter? I quit Twitter. I go on Instagram sometimes to post because it's a little bit like my bread and butter. But other than that, I don't... No, I've seen something tweet to Ria. Is that not your site? It is my account. It's dead and gone like years ago. You're, you're off social media. And you've got a hashtag or you've got a called renew. Is that a message you are sending that this is the new Ria that you're going to see in front of you now? That's the old Ria. There's a, what does renew mean? I think it's not a message. I'm not sending a message to anybody. I, it was what I felt about myself. I felt that I've, I've completely changed. My understanding about life, my understanding about, you know, society has changed so much because of what I went through. I had friends leave me. Then there was a time I had friends who showed up who I didn't expect it from. There was a time when people didn't want to come near me. And then it was suddenly a time where it was kind of cool to know me. Uh, but come from the back door entry. <laughs> uh, then there was a time when people were very curious to talk to me. But like the only question they wanted to ask me was, how does the jail food I was like, sushi and caviar are not in jail. I don't know how much but people, I, I, I've, I've seen it all and I've seen it all really fast. And that for me has maybe left me unfazed or indifferent is the word I'm looking for. Because I no longer get ecstatic with the small raptures and I no longer get broken uh, with the big failures. During that period, even WhatsApp conversations of yours were put out in the media. Did you feel that that was a complete violation because even today every now and then we see whatsapp conversations of people in different situations coming out do you believe that that is a complete violation of an individual's privacy and is it possible to be private anymore in this world i think uh, privacy should not be an option uh, privacy should be the norm Everyone should have a right to a private life unless they are actually terrorists, unless it's a matter of national security. I think every one of us here has the right to be private. We are, as individuals, are private people and public people. We choose to have certain aspects of our life trusted in the public opinion and public forum, but not certain private aspects. How would you like it if there was a camera in your bedroom with your wife? You wouldn't. In the same way, I wouldn't like it too. In the same way, if I'm texting my partner or my parent or my close friend, I wouldn't like anyone to read it. What is though the biggest lesson, Ria, that you've learned over these three years? Is there something you would have done differently in your life when you look back now? I would have smashed the patriarchy way before. Way before 2020. <laughs> you want to turn around and show people that, that, that dress that you've got? It says smash the patriarchy on the side.
Is that what you would have done? That you invested so much of your life in Sushant's, uh, you know, it was almost as if you had completely given up your life to be with Sushant. And then when something happens to him, you're seen as the, as the villain or the vamp. Is that something you would change? For no. young woman, women out there who may be deeply in love, I think, no, it's not vis-a-vis -vis him. Um, I think it's more vis-a-vis -vis the conditioning that we have as women. You know, growing up, you're taught to be a good girl. A girl should dress like this, talk like this, don't drink like, don't drink, don't hold a glass at a party, don't do this, don't do that. Achhi ladki, gandhi ladki. Are, tumko jo ladki banna hai, bano. Because boys are not given this. Boys are not told ki aap aise betho, aise chalo, ye khao, ye mat piyo, ye mat karo. So I feel that conditioning, I would have smashed that way before. And it's not entirely, it's not one person's fault. It's in society by and large. Like I would like to tell the young girls and young women out there, please live your life the way you want to live your life. And you dressing a certain way, talking a certain way, uh, or having a certain life habit does not make you a good girl or a bad girl. Are you a good girl? <laughs> Most definitely not. <laughs> My final question to you, what next? What's your ambition? You've gone on the sets of MTV Roadies as a gang leader. But what next for Rhea Chakraborty? Are you still waiting for someone like a Mahesh Bhatt to come and say, Rhea, let's do a film together? Is that, as I said, where next for Rhea Chakraborty? See, honestly, if there's one thing I've learned in 2020 is that your life doesn't go as planned. <laughs> because I certainly didn't plan to land up in jail. According to my plan, I was an actor. Hopefully, I would have been a successful actor, a more successful actor. One day, I would get married and then I would have children and then I would do some more films. Maybe I would do mother roles, maybe I would do sister roles, but I would continue being an actor. Now, that didn't happen. So, sitting where I am sitting today, it would be stupid of me to try and tell you that Rajdi, mujhe lagta hai na, meri zindagi mein aisa hoga. Mujhe nahi pata. I don't know where my life is going to go. I'm just hoping that it goes to a good place. I'm hoping that the highs and the lows kind of, you know, the summation is zero. That's the best that I can expect from it. And I'm hoping that I'm able to drown out the noise and keep the inner voice the loudest at all points. So, when you're People who are watching this interview today on TV and are already trending. Rhea Chakrabarti is a killer or Rhea Chakrabarti is the chudel as we called it. What do you want to tell all those trolls out there? I love you too. Really? Yeah. Are you sure that you're going to be able to handle all those trolls out there? You're going to be handling them as your channel. <laughs> I'm well, going to go <laughs> home and eat matar paneer and roti. <laughs> you know, Rhea Chakraborty, it can't be as easy as you make it out to be. Uh, a girl from a middle class family with all her dreams comes to Mumbai and suddenly finds herself in the midst of this story that catapults in various directions. But I'm glad to see you smiling. That's the big difference from the Rhea Chakraborty I saw then, who was tearful. I presume though, occasionally, there might be a tear in the eye every, uh, every now and then, or is that completely gone? Do you, do you cry? I cry a lot. I cry a lot. I cry in movies. I cry in sorrow. I cry in pain. I cry if anybody else, any of my girlfriends go through a breakup. I cry for everyone. I have not lost my emotions, Rajdeep. I have just become stronger. Doesn't mean I don't cry anymore, I still cry. And I think that I would like to say that people often keep saying this to me, you're a strong person, strong girl. To me, the biggest strength, and I think this is what I want Indian men and women both to understand, vulnerability is the biggest superpower one can have. It's the only power you have as a human being. And I accept my vulnerability. As I did with you last time, I'm doing with you again now. A strong vulnerable woman who's been to hell and back and in a way the fact that she's come back to speak to us so openly I think is the way is, is proof that you are really at least in your own mind are convinced 
that you have no one to answer for but your own conscience. Riya Chakrabarti, I wish you well and thank you very much for joining us. I will take the trolling and you can, in a way, smile your way and hope that better things are around the corner. Thank you very much for doing this. Riya Chakrabarti, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajdeep. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you.